Hi everybody. So on yesterday we ended up talking about narratives of poverty and we didn't have time to go into the sociological theories of poverty. So this is just going to be a quick video to catch everybody up. The PowerPoint is already on Moodle uh, so you can go through it for yourself but I just wanted to talk you through this, uh, this section of the lecture. Uh, you're free to watch this video. Um, this material will be, you know, covered on exams, so you should know it. Um, so I hope this video will be helpful. So we're just going to talk about some major theories of poverty uh, that sociologists use. Uh, we're going to begin with conflict theory. Then we're going to talk about a couple of different functionalist perspectives. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a cultural argument that some sociologists use to discuss poverty. So um, the first theory I want us to talk about that helps us understand how sociologists think about poverty um, is conflict theory by Karl Marx. Uh, so there are other conflict theorists of poverty, certainly. Uh, I would venture to say that most theorists of poverty are conflict theorists, so this is a really prevalent theory. Um, however, Karl Marx was the first person to really theorize uh, the role of poverty in society as a sociologist. So we're going to talk about Marx and his theory as it relates to conflict theories of poverty. Uh, understanding that we could expand on this and elaborate on this with other more contemporary theorists. But just as a foundation, um, Marx theorized that capitalists, who he called the bourgeoisie, own the means of production. A means of production is anything that generates value. So you could think of a means of production as being like a factory uh, that produces goods. Um, a farm that produces food, um, a uh, truck or a taxi cab that generates revenue by uh, moving people or things. You could think of a means of production as a ship, like a cargo ship that makes money by shipping things. Uh, you could think of a means of production as an infrastructure or technology that allows you to generate profit. So we all may have access to means of production in different ways, but Marx says those who own the means of production are the ruling or more dominant class, the bourgeoisie. Um, essentially, they're the people who profit from the means of production. So an example would be um, I uh, own a car but I don't profit from my car. Um, I just drive it. Uh, who owns the means of production is, uh, who owns the means of production is like Toyota. Toyota made my car. Toyota profits when I buy a car. So um, the workers in the factory get paid to make cars, but they don't own the factory. They just work in the factory. So when I buy a car, it doesn't immediately or directly help a factory worker. It immediately or directly benefits shareholders in the Toyota Corporation. They're the capitalists who own the means of production. Uh, Marx contrasts the capitalist or the bourgeoisie with the workers, who he calls the proletariat. Uh, a, a proletarian or a, a worker is anyone who sells labor for wages. I am a worker. I do not own Birmingham Southern College. Birmingham Southern College is a not-for-profit organization, uh, meaning I can't own stock in Birmingham Southern College. Nonetheless, I don't own the university or college infrastructure. I just work here. Uh, and if I quit showing up for work and quit doing my work, they would quit paying me. Uh, I'm, I'm a worker. I sell my labor for wages. Now, my labor is different from some other people's labor in that it's thought work. Um, my stock in trade is my brain, not my body or my muscles or uh, my feet, but I'm still doing work for pay uh, in the same way that a factory worker does work for pay, uh, in the same way that a farmer or a farm laborer does work for pay. 
Um, and capitalists, according to Marx, make profit by extracting surplus from workers. So this is where the idea of exploitation enters the equation for Marx. Uh, if I'm a business owner, let's say that I own a factory uh, and we make cheese. I own a factory and we make cheese. Uh, and I have people who work for me in this factory creating cheese. Uh, and we sell the cheese and I make profit. How do I make profit? Well, the workers create a product that I can sell for more than I pay the workers. If all of the money I made selling cheese went to the workers, there'd be no profit for me. Um, now, of course, some money has to go toward like maintaining the means of production, maintaining the cheese factory, right? So if I own this factory selling cheese, making cheese, uh, I can't pay the workers everything that they produce. I can't give them the value of their labor. If I did, then once I, I paid the bills and paid the workers, there'd be nothing, there'd be no profit. So for Marx, this means that I am exploiting my workers. I am taking away the value of their labor. I'm not giving them the fullness of what they create, what they produce. Um, so another example would be a farm worker. Um, if I'm a small scale farmer, like a subsistence farmer, and I grow my own food, uh, let's say I uh, just have a vegetable garden and I eat what comes out of the garden, maybe I sell what I can't eat, right? Uh, then I'm a capitalist. I own the means of production. I may also be the only laborer um, on, in that garden. Now let's say that I can't manage my garden by myself, so I hire my friend Sarah to work in my garden. Uh, and I pay Sarah, um, let's say, above minimum wage. I'm a good boss. I don't want to pay minimum wage, so I pay $10 an hour to Sarah. Um, well, that assumes that Sarah can grow and pick enough in an hour that I can sell it for more than $10, right? Whatever Sarah produces in that hour is going to be worth more than $10 to me. Uh, because when I was the, the only laborer, it was acceptable for me to just get the value of my labor. I got whatever I, whatever I grew, I either ate it or I sold it and kept the money. But now I'm a capitalist. Uh, now it only makes sense for me to pay Sarah less than the value of what she produces. Uh, because if I'm paying her the full value of what she produces, I'm not getting anything out of the deal. I mean, perhaps I am, I'm helping Sarah out and I'm avoiding food waste, but in that way, Sarah's just a part owner with me, right? I'm just sharing my profits with Sarah. Um, so Mark says, wherever you have people making profit, you have exploitation. That in order to turn a profit, I have to take more from somebody than they produce or take more from somebody than they get. I have to take some of the value of their labor away from them. Uh, capitalists call this surplus labor. Uh, Marx calls this exploited labor. Um, so uh, poverty directly benefits capitalists for Marx. Um, it's obvious to Marx how, or it's obvious from Marx how labor benefits capitalists, right? Um, people working for you create value that they don't get. They create value that you then skim off of to make a profit. Uh, but for Marx, conditions of poverty directly benefit capitalists. Now this may be less obvious, so let me explain. Um, if you live in a, in a society where regardless of working, uh, regardless of employment, um, you have everything you need. Uh, let's say you live in a utopian society where you can work or not work, but food is abundant, housing is free, health care is guaranteed, um, and education for your children is provided. Um, 
if you live in such a society, you might choose not to sell your wages, your labor for wages. You might decide, you know, I don't really need a job. I, I have what I need, whether I work or not. So why would I go to a job and work for an employer? You might decide to do something entrepreneurial. Uh, you might decide to stay home and garden and grow your own food. You might decide to spend time caring for elders or children or raising your family instead of, uh, or just enjoying yourself instead of going to work. Um, if there were no threat of poverty, if there were no need looming over us, would we sell our time, our energy, our life force for wages? Marx says no. Marx says we wouldn't. Now this is debatable, of course, because there are societies where, while not utopian, a lot of basic needs are provided or guaranteed. Uh, and in those societies, people generally still work um, because most people are not content with a bare minimum subsistence standard of living. Most people want luxurious things. Most people want things above and beyond what we truly need. Um, and many people want the creativity or the joy that comes with engaging in a profession or a trade. Uh, many people find a lot of pleasure in their work. So there are examples of people working without the threat of need looming over them. Um, but for Marx, poverty drives people to work. Not only does it drive people to work, uh, which we might think about that argument and say, well, good, right? Good. Uh, that's necessary. If people didn't have any motivation to work, where would we be as a society? Fair enough. But for Marx, um, having people fear poverty doesn't just force them into work. It forces them to accept working conditions and levels of pay that they would otherwise find unacceptable. So if, if I were to be looking for another job now, I have all my needs met. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to brag or to give too much insight into my personal life. But my family income is not dependent on my income, right? My husband earns enough money that we would have our basic needs met even if I didn't bring home a paycheck for a little while, right? We couldn't do anything extra, but we'd be able to afford housing, food, and health care, uh, for example. Uh, we couldn't go on vacation. We couldn't buy Christmas presents for people, but we'd be okay for a while, right? So if I were looking for another job and they said, you know what, I'm going to pay you half of what you're accustomed to making. I would say absolutely not. Um, if they said, you know, I'm going to pay you about half or a third of what you need to live, I'd say, no way, I'll just stay home and not work. But if I had the threat of poverty looming over me, and somebody said, you know, you can work for me for 40 hours a week, and I'm going to pay you about half or two-thirds of what, it, what you would need to live. So you'll need another job, too, uh, for at least part of the week. I might say okay, right? So we have this, we discussed yesterday how we have this poverty threshold. Um, we consider people to be in poverty when they have $25,500 a year. That's not what a person needs to live, right? And that's for a family of four. That's not enough money to support a family of four. And we decided that with two adults earning minimum wage consistently, working 40 hours a week, um, they would only earn about $32,000 a year. Uh, so, you know, basically we cajole people through threat of poverty into accepting a wage that isn't enough to support a family. Um, where if basic needs were met, people might insist, you know, my labor is worth more than that. If I'm going to spend 40 hours a week working for you, you're going to have to pay me rather more. Um, but the threat of poverty forces people to accept conditions they may not otherwise want to accept. 
Uh, in this way, it benefits capitalists because capitalists can provide fewer working condition, you know, worse working conditions and lower pay and still have a reliable workforce because the threat of poverty keeps people dependent. Um, so in this way, uh, poverty alienates workers from one another. So if we are laboring under the threat of poverty, we may have this desperation mentality. We may have this mentality that if there are too few jobs to go around and not enough money to be had from working just one job, so a lot of people need more than one, um, then it's me against you. If we're all workers, I may see your pay and your well-being as a threat to my own. Your secure employment may be a job I can't get, right? So in this way, it alienates workers from one another. Um, it also alienates workers from one another because um, working relationships are, uh, are conducted under the constant threat of loss of work, right? If I work with you, I may be constantly fearful that you will take on too many responsibilities and then they won't need me anymore and I'll get fired, right? Or I may worry that you're going to make me look bad or that if you get paid more, they'll pay me less, right? So we al we're alienated from one another through poverty. Um, for Marx, workers will eventually develop class consciousness, which is this awareness of our own exploitation. Uh, and then we will revolt against the capitalist class. Now, it's unclear that that's imminent, right? It's unclear that we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, however, uh, for Marx, this is, the, this is the natural conclusion of capitalism, is that workers will eventually realize that we're being exploited, get sick of being exploited, and work together to own the means of production. So all the workers in my cheese factory will say, you know what, we're sick of you selling the cheese for, you know, uh, $20 a wheel of cheese. I don't know what cheese costs. I'm a vegan. Um, we're sick of you selling this cheese for so much money and then paying us so little. We want to own the cheese factory. And we're going to sell the cheese and share the profits among ourselves. Um, so that would be a revolution uh, that Marx has in mind. So when Marx says workers will revolt, he doesn't necessarily mean in a political fashion. He doesn't necessarily mean that workers will rise up as an army and overthrow the government. Marx has in mind an economic revolution where workers will say, you know, we're going to work together to come to control the means of production. And they could do this through ownership, through investment, through asset sharing, right? So when he says revolution, he doesn't necessarily mean a violent overthrow of a government or economy. But the idea is that things will change in an important way. Uh, structural functionalism is another theory that sociologists use to understand poverty. Uh, and the, the kind of foundational thinker in this uh, line of theory is Emile Durkheim. Uh, Emile Durkheim uh, was a Frenchman, um, and his name is Emile, not Emily. Um, and he says that wealthy people control both the means of production, but also uh, can you know, accumulate and consolidate wealth through the ownership of goods. So he says classes in society cannot be neatly divided into those who control the means of production and those who work for wages because, of course, we consider some wage workers to be wealthy. Um, consider professional athletes. They don't own the team that they play for. Uh, although some of them own, sh own stock in the team, I suppose. But they're not owners of the sports team or of the league or of the television networks that air the sports, uh, 
competitions, they just play and they get a paycheck. It's a very large paycheck. Same thing with, for example, Hollywood actors. They don't own the movie studio or the production company, uh, but they labor for wages. A lot of wages, but still labor for wages. Um, but it would be foolish to say that they have more in common with the janitor than they have in common with the CEO, right? Or the shareholders. Obviously, they have so many goods that they're wealthy. Um, so for Emil Durkheim, uh, you can, and Emil Durkheim might use the example of a person with inherited wealth who doesn't work. He doesn't own means of production. He doesn't have, you know, a business that generates profit for him. He just inherited a lot of money versus a farmer who owns her farm and works on her farm uh, and owns the means of production but just ekes out a living, right? So for Emil Durkheim, ownership of goods and means are both important. Um, and poor people are those who are kept from accessing both means and goods. So uh, poor people may be excluded from participation in the means of production um, or ownership of the means of production and also kept from owning goods um, in, a, in a number of ways. Um, now for Durkheim and structural functionalists in general, um, it's not obvious that poverty is bad. Uh, just like Marx said, poverty benefits the capitalists, structural functionalists would say poverty benefits society. Uh, more contemporary structural functionalists, for example, uh, Davis and Moore, argued that poverty and wealth inequality in general uh, is necessary for a productive division of labor in society. So if we are to have a society that functions smoothly, we need people who are willing to do jobs that are unpleasant. Um, we need people who are willing to uh, work serving hamburgers, uh, I've, washing dishes. Um, we, need to, we need people who are willing to collect garbage and work in recycling centers. Uh, we need people who are willing to scrub floors and toilets. And if there were no threat of poverty, Durkheim says, and functionalists say, who would do that work? Uh, of course, there are other ways we can incentivize doing that work. For example, we could pay people who do unpleasant jobs really well. Um, to encourage them to do those those tasks, which are definitely necessary for society. Uh, we could reward garbage collectors in the same way we reward doctors and attorneys. We could pay them a lot and give them pretty nice working conditions. Um, instead, we, uh, we have taken on the model that like wealth inequality incentivizes the people who can't do anything else to do jobs that no one else wants. Um, and for Durkheim and other structural functionalists, poverty is not necessarily a dysfunction. It's not necessarily society failing. It may be a necessary part of society functioning the way we need it to function. So um, we'll talk more about this argument later, but I just wanna lay it out for you. Another way we understand poverty um, some people consider Weber, Max Weber, to be a structural functionalist because he said that revolution will not happen in the way Marx predicted. Other people see him as a conflict theorist because he saw inequality and exploitation as bad. Um, so you can argue exactly how to categorize Max Weber. But the contribution he made is one we talked about yesterday um, when we talked about the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. So in order to understand Weber's contribution, Weber was German. 
Weber was a student of Marx, uh, in that he studied Marx, not that he Marx was his professor or something, right? He studied Marx, um, and he said that in order to really understand the Industrial Revolution and the capitalist system that emerged from it, it's really necessary to understand Protestant Christianity. Uh, he said that U.S. society, I'm extrapolating to the U.S., but he said that European society in the Industrial Age um, is shaped by Protestant Christianity. Um, under Catholicism, as we discussed briefly yesterday, uh, there's the idea that the poor are always with us, that some people are poor, but this is not a shameful way to be. Um, there are many examples in the Bible and in Catholic uh, Apocrypha of poor people who were sainted, poor people who were noble, poor people who worked hard, and just didn't earn very much. Um, Catholicism is also very critical of exploiting workers, um, and Catholicism is critical of having uncharitable attitudes towards the poor. Um, Protestantism uh, and the Calvinist ethic that really took hold in Western Europe and the United States um, there has the idea of predestination. In other words, whether you go to heaven or hell is predetermined from your birth um, or from your conception. Um, you are either destined for heaven or you're not. And there's nothing you can do about it. And there's no way to know. However, uh, the idea is that God favors the elect. God favors those who will go to heaven. Um, and so if you are the elect, then you are more likely to have an easier time in this life, to be favored, to be uh, blessed by God in, in your earthly life. Um, and so material wealth is seen as a manifestation of God's favor. Uh, there's also the idea in... Um, there's also the idea in uh, Protestantism that ostentatious wealth or profligate wealth is inappropriate. So even if you're wealthy, and wealth is a sign of God's favor, you shouldn't be lavish. You shouldn't live an extravagant lifestyle. You should work hard, uh, do your duty, be morally upright, and live a modest and humble lifestyle. Um, so with modesty as a goal, um, what do you do if you happen to have money? Do you spend it on lavish living? No. You reinvest it. You save it or you reinvest it. Um, so in, uh, so under this Protestant ethic, Weber says, it really lends itself to capitalism because there's this positive value put on work. Material wealth is not an accident of birth or an accident of circumstance. It's a sign of God's favor to be actively pursued. Uh, and it's to be invested and used wisely. Uh, and there are biblical, you know, scriptural uh, stories and narratives that support this idea. Um, that can be pointed to as kind of evidence that this is true. So work is seen as an evidence of good, of good morals, uh, and poverty is seen as a moral judgment. So if you're poor, you must have done something wrong. You must not be working hard or saving responsibly, or you must have sinned and God is punishing you. So we have this, this moral judgment uh, we also have the idea uh, that comes from biblical narratives and from Protestant philosophy and Protestant theology um, of the de deserving versus the undeserving poor. So the deserving poor are those who, through catastrophe or through inability to work, 
uh, are facing kind of temporary poverty. Um, whereas the undeserving poor are those who through their own choices uh, or their own doing uh, don't have a lot of money or don't have a job. So an example of the deserving poor might be a blind person uh, of a certain age who can't find work anymore. So maybe an 80 year old person with blindness um, would be an example of someone who's deserving. We can't expect an 80 year old person who doesn't see well um, to get most jobs, right? So they may be in poverty through no fault of their own. Um, another thing we might, uh, another person we might see as deserving is like a mother who's lost her home and everything she owns in a fire or in a tornado. That person is deserving of our pity and deserving of our acceptance and deserving of our help. Um, an undeserving poor person might be someone who drops out of school um, and follows a band around on tour for a year and uh, chooses to live in a tent. Um, Another example, a more common example of someone who we would see as undeserving is someone who, because they have an addiction, isn't able to hold down a job. Uh, or someone who um, chooses to do something unprofitable, like stay home with their children instead of working for money. Um, we, we may see those people as undeserving, and this comes from Protestant Christian values. Uh, which have shaped our society. Uh, Protestant Christian values also played a role in kind of systemic racism, um, settler colonialism, uh, and chattel slavery. So not to say that Protestant versus Catholic Christianity is, you know, is necessary for this, but um, a lot of settler colonialism was perpetrated under the kind of narrative of we're bringing these people enlightenment, not just religious enlightenment, but also economic enlightenment. We're, we're enlightening these cultures to the ways of capitalism. Um, and you can still hear those narratives echoed in defense of slavery and racism today, that by bringing enslaved people to the United States or by uh, enslaving and exploiting uh, Latinx and indigenous peoples, that we brought them uh, knowledge of Christianity and we brought them uh, the value of capitalism and work. Um, you hear these narratives rather more rarely than was true in historical discourse, but you can still hear them echoed today. Um, and in the time period of slavery and settler colonialism in the United States, you know, in its inception, um, these were very active narratives that people were rehearsing to defend settler colonialism and chattel slavery. Um, so we, we had this idea that uh, people who were not European, who were not Christian, and who were not capitalist, needed salvation, enlightenment, uh, and rescue uh, through capitalism, Christianity, and work. So building on this idea of Protestant ethics and our understandings of poverty today, um, we have this idea um, most famously argued by William Julius Wilson, although many people echo this idea, um, of culture of poverty. And most of us are familiar with this narrative, even if we've never heard it called this. And backing up just a step, sociology is a balance between structure and agency. So structure refers to social forces, social institutions, and social circumstances that shape our lives. Agency refers to our own ability uh, to do something about our lives. So structure might be that I'm born in a poor rural area with a bad school system. Um, 
that might tend to prevent me from getting ahead economically. But agency is my ability to study hard, pursue scholarships, try my best, right? Um, so William Julius Wilson argues uh, on the side of agency. He argues that structure plays an important role in people's economic circumstances but that people also have agency and make choices. And he argues that when people live in circumstances where, in which they're surrounded by poverty, uh, conditions of deprivation shape their mindsets and their behaviors. So uh, sort of like Avery uh, Rhodes was talking about in, um, in our lab meeting this morning, um, if you are constantly in a circumstance of deprivation, you may have really different abilities to plan, really different priorities, uh, really different ways of thinking, and really different judgment calls. So uh, William Julius Wilson argues that conditions of deprivation shape people's mindset and behavior, and that poverty is reinforced and reproduced through individual choices. And he argues that this happens on a cultural level. He's particularly talking about inner city poverty in areas of concentrated economic deprivation. So he's talking about people who grow up in very poor neighborhoods in inner city areas where most of the people around them are poor uh, and where it's very difficult to envision alternatives. So uh, examples he gives um, imagine that you go to a school system where nobody who graduates from your high school goes to college or gets a good job. Imagine that your school is so underfunded, so under-resourced, and so underconnected that nobody who graduates ahead of you in school has gotten a college degree or has gotten a highly paid job. Everybody just kind of either drops out or finishes and stays in the neighborhood and flounders around at a low-paying job. Um, if that's the case, why would you try hard in school? If you understand that your efforts are unlikely to be rewarded uh, toward education, why would you try very hard in school? And he says that when you have concentrated poverty, you have conditions that are demotivating and conditions that limit people's abilities to make good choices. Um, Catherine Eden, who wrote the New York Times article we read for Lab, uh, wrote a book called Promises I Can Keep. Um, and she wrote about why single mothers often prioritize parenthood over marriage. Uh, and why uh, mothers who live in conditions of poverty may choose to parent on their own. And it may be that they feel ill-equipped to, uh, to accomplish a successful marriage, that most of the marriages around them don't end well um, or aren't happy and fulfilled. Uh, and so they may choose to avoid kind of the economic entanglements of marriage in favor of parenting on their own uh, because that's something they feel confident they can achieve. Um, she also argues that when you're parenting in conditions of poverty, you may not be able to promise your child economic security. You may not be able to promise your child a secure future. What you can do is give them things that make them happy in the short term. So why wouldn't you? Um, I, uh, I grew up with an aunt uh, who was a single mother in po living in poverty. And we always thought it was really strange that her son always had the latest fashion. Her son always had really nice sneakers and really nice jeans and really nice looking shirts. And we thought, this is strange. Because she doesn't even, like, she, she has no savings. She lives in kind of substandard housing. And she sends her son to a bad school. Why is she emphasizing 
how he looks and spending so much money on how he dresses? And the answer is pretty obvious. She couldn't do anything about the substandard housing. Even if she saved the money she spent on clothing, she wasn't going to be able to afford a house. Uh, she lived in a rural area. There were no apartments. She lived in a single wide trailer. She wasn't going to be able to do anything about housing, even if she saved that money. Um, she couldn't afford to move to send him to a better school. What could she do? She could give him nice clothes so he fit in and didn't get bullied. So that's what she did. Um, and in retrospect, those choices make a lot of sense, given the context she lived in. But so William Julius Wilson takes a rather kind of less charitable approach to this and says that culture is shaped by circumstances, uh, that culture emerges based on social structure, but then culture shapes behavior. And that this culture of poverty keeps people in poverty over and over and over, generation after generation. Uh, and it becomes a mindset rather than just a collection of circumstances so that you can change the circumstances. But if you don't change the mindset, people will just raise their children in a mindset of poverty and will continue to reproduce poverty. So this is a really common argument that we hear. And even though it's not as foundational a theory as the others we've talked about, we can't talk about modern poverty studies without talking about William Julius Wilson. The books he wrote are called The Truly Disadvantaged, about uh, urban inner city poverty in areas of concentrated deprivation, and more than just race, about how blackness intersects with inner city poverty, and how what he calls poverty culture um, has influenced black culture and vice versa. Um, so, he faces a lot of understandable criticisms, um, the most common being that he's a victim blamer, that he's taking people and blaming them for their circumstances. Uh, a more nuanced understanding of William Julius Wilson says that he's looking at how structure affects agency and agency affects structure. Um, but he is nonetheless, whatever you, whatever you think of his theory, an incredibly influential thinker whose theory is, in, is essential to understand. So that takes me to the conclusion of my discussion of theory related to poverty. Uh, I've probably talked longer than I needed to to get the point across, but I hope that you'll find this instructive and helpful. Uh, please email me as always if you have any questions, and I look forward to seeing you again next week.